uh, discussion tonight. We just pray that you bless all that's about to be said and done. Thank you for each and every person that's online as well as those here under the sound of my voice. We just ask that you bless them now and bless their time with us tonight. And we just ask that you continue to lead us and guide us in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, tonight, to, uh, as we mentioned, we want to have a conversation with the chief uh, of Fort Walton Beach Police Department, Chief Robert Bates. He's going to be here, uh, have a presentation for you. Many of you uh, know that if you got questions, you can uh, call in or uh, text in on Zoom and uh, just let us know your questions uh, at the, in the same time. Uh, we've already given him some questions. He may not be able to get through every question uh, that we sent him, but if I'm, I'm sure that if we really want an answer, he'll get it back to us, even if he's not able to cover it here tonight. So I encourage you to just be attentive, and, and uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to chime in. This time, I'm going to get out the way and let the chief come and give his presentation. Good evening. I'd like to thank everybody that's come here in person, everybody online, and everybody that's participating in the forum with us. We're going to do this in three parts, as the pastor alluded to. There is a formal presentation that we prepared to try and keep the consistency, because we'll give this presentation not just to this group, but to other groups. I then have 22 questions, and pastor, I answered all 22 questions, so I can answer them all here for us as long as we have time to. And then I'll take any questions from the audience and or online. And I told the pastor I have nothing to do until breakfast, so we'll stay as long as somebody wants to ask a question or somebody has a concern they want to bring up. So I'll start with the formal presentation, and it's right there. It's building trust through transparency. And I guess it's being displayed on the Zoom folks, too, at home, so they can see it. So you can go to the next slide. And you can see right there, it gives a big, long list of stuff that we're going to cover. But we'll just go to the next slide, and we'll just dive right into the presentation. So one of the first things, and it came out in the president's executive order, and it's one of the things I spoke about when I first got here, was reattaining our accreditation standard. Accreditation is an independent body that comes in and looks at the practices of the police department. There's about 250 things that they'll inspect the police department for. And you have to be in compliance with all the standards. They won't tell you exactly what you have to do, but there's minimum standards that you have to meet. And you can meet those standards any way you want, you just have to meet those standards. They'll talk about inspections, audits, transparency, community engagement, use of force, pursuit, property, returning of property. So there's 250 things that are covered through accreditation. And that was one of my top goals was to get our accreditation standards back because we were the first department in Okaloosa County to become accredited. And then we were the force to lose our accreditation. And now we're in the process of reattaining our accreditation. And I'm probably not going to read exactly off the slide, so it may not follow 100%, but you can go to the next slide. Use of force. Use of force is one of the things that is probably the hottest topic right now in policing. So we wanted to start off our presentation with a use of force slide. And for use of force, and you can see on the slide, we anchor everything on the sanctity of life. So it's the sanctity of life which guides us for our use of force. It doesn't say it on the slide, but we changed one of our philosophies to where it used to be, I go home safely at the end of the night. Our new philosophy, our new motto of the department is, everybody goes home safely at the end of the night. Our goal is to ensure that everybody goes home at the end of the night. And I'm going to pull the printed slides that I have because they're a little bit faded on the back wall. So you can see our use of force, the sanctity of human life, and everything we do is consistent with that core principle and that core model. You can go to the next slide. So a lot of people ask, when do officers use force? And it's one of the questions that were written in one of the responses. We use force for lawful objectives. That could be to defend somebody, to defend ourselves, or to effect an arrest. That's when force is used. And the goal of force is to achieve compliance. And once compliance is achieved, there should be no more force used. So you can see that those three points on the slide. You can go to the next slide. The next slide talks about the critical decision-making model. So our officers that are out on the street, we developed a framework for them to go through. And the framework is, and it'll be on the next slide, is a model that when they're confronted with a situation, 
they can go through these mental steps in their head. And we train with it, we rehearse with it. When they write the reports, they use it. We did role playing training today in the station with some actors that came in from other places. They go through this critical decision making model. And the model is anchored on our ethics, values, proportionality, and once again, the sanctity of human life. So if you go to the next slide, you'll actually see the model. So it may be hard for some of you to see, especially if you're sitting in the back, but the model basically talks about collecting of information, assessing the threats or the situation or the risks, considering policies and agency procedures, identifying options, and that's a key step that some models don't have, is that we want to identify options that we have. Just because somebody may be armed with a knife or something may be going on, we may not have to match force with force. There may be other options available to us. We talk a lot about time, distance, and cover. So if we have somebody that may not be armed with a firearm, because a firearm changes the situation a little bit, because it's hard to get distance from a firearm, the reaction from a firearm is very fast, but if somebody had a knife, if somebody had a stick, a bat, we may be able to back up a few feet, slow things down, create some distance and some time, and speak with them. And we'll get into some of that when we get through this presentation. We really harp on communication skills and making requests versus giving orders. There may be a point when we have to give orders, but at first we'd like to make requests. Can you drop the knife? Can you put the knife down? Instead of ordering them right from the start, drop the knife, drop the knife, drop the knife, because they're really not keying in on the commands we're giving. They're probably going through some type of crisis, and maybe by asking them questions, we can start now to engaging them in communications and have them come down from their crisis. So the next step in the model is to act and then to review. And you can see the model is circular because you may try something, it may or may not work, you may collect more data or more information, then you reassess, you then examine your agency policies and laws, then you identify your options and then you act. And it may seem cumbersome, but if you think about it, it's basically what you do in your everyday life. If you walk into a bank, you're gonna collect information, you're gonna assess what's going on, how long is the line, am I gonna stay, am I gonna go to the teller, do I go to the ATM? You may consider what you have to do and how you're bound to do it, and then you identify solutions, that line looks shorter, that line looks longer, you act, and then you review. So it's something that's naturally done. We just wanted to reinforce that model with the officers. You can go to the next slide. The next slide talks about a duty to intervene. It's something that you hear about a lot on the news. For us, it was not news. The duty to intervene is something that we'd had as soon as I came to the department. One of the first things I did was we rewrote our use of force policy. And when we, re when we rewrote our use of force policy, the duty to intervene was included. You can tell that there's agencies out there right now that don't have a duty to intervene because there's message boards for law enforcement, just like there's message boards and groups for everything else. And on these boards, there's agencies soliciting from departments, hey, can we get a copy of your duty to intervene policy? Do you guys have a duty to intervene policy? So it's something that we've had with the Fort Walton Beach Police Department. And basically it says officers will intervene when they know or should know another officer is using unreasonable force. George Floyd incident, those officers, if that was to occur within the city of Fort Walton Beach, would have had a duty to intervene. They would have to take action to stop that officer for doing what he did because that would have been known as a unreasonable or should have been known as an unreasonable application of force. So we have a duty to intervene. We go to the next slide. We have de-escalation. De-escalation is another term that is coming up with reform, with with the news media, with conversations going across the nation. Once again, this is something that we've had in our policy and we reinforced when we rewrote our policy about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. And it says, when feasible, officers are expected to use de-escalation tactics under the totality of the circumstances. So you take a circumstance in as a whole. There may be times when you have more time, when you can back up. If an officer was standing at the edge of a cliff, to make the most simplistic example possible, they may have less options available to them. When you're in a big room like we're standing in right now, and if the pastor was over there, I'm a great distance away from him. So I may have more tactics available to me 
there's chairs in between us. So he cannot directly attack me in one movement. So in this situation, I would try to de-escalate the situation. I would try to speak with him. If he took a step forward, I might take a step backwards. At some point, I may run up to a wall where I can no longer take a step backwards. If the pastor then threatened somebody else's life, I may no longer have that choice where I can now continue the de-escalation, and there may become a point where I have to meet force with force. But when feasible, and within the totality of the circumstances, we expect our officers to de-escalate. You can go to the next slide. The issues come out about warning before the use of lethal force. Our policy requires, just like we talked with de-escalation, if it's possible, we give a warning, especially if we're going to use deadly force. And even if we use less lethal force, we try to give a warning when it's feasible and when it's possible. There could be situations that could arise where it may not be feasible, but I can tell you that the majority of the time, if not 99% of the time, we do give a warning before using lethal force. We can go to the next slide. Discharge of a firearm from a vehicle. We have a policy that basically forbids it except for a few options. And the slide says officers should not intentionally place themselves in a position of danger when attempting to approach or pursue a motor vehicle and should avoid situations which make the use of a motor vehicle a possible threat or deadly serious physical bodily injury to the officer. If you go to the next slide, that's where we'll talk about the exceptions when we will allow an officer to shoot at a moving vehicle. And the two exceptions are basically if somebody in the vehicle is shooting out, and you may say that probably never happens. Just before I left North Miami, we had a guy that stole a car, drove down the street, and was shooting at people in, from his stolen car. That would be a vehicle that we could shoot back at if it was to occur here because we want to stop that immediate threat of somebody using deadly force inside the vehicle. The other, option, the other time that we could shoot at a moving vehicle and be within policy is if the vehicle or the driver of the vehicle has demonstrated their intentions to use the vehicle as a weapon, like you saw in New York when a car tried to run down bicyclists, like you've seen in Germany when they went into a market and tried to run over people. If we had a vehicle driving through the landing as we had some type of festival or something there, officers could possibly shoot into that vehicle and still be within policy. But those are the only two allowable times, at least in the city of Fort Walton Beach, when you can shoot at a moving vehicle. You go to the next slide. Use of force continuum. That's another phrase that you may hear on the news media or in discussions about police reform. It is something that we've had and is something that we revised when we wrote our use of force policy about a year ago. And the use of force continuum is a guide intended to give officers a visual model to learn various levels of force and resistance to the appropriate subject control response. It sounds complicated, but if we go to the next slide, you'll see that it's basically a chart. And if you look at it, if the subject comes with you with lethal force, which is at that bottom right red box, you can use any option up to and including lethal force. So you may be able just to come up and speak with the person. You may be able to take cover. You may be able to use some other tactic. Just because you're confronted with lethal force does not mean you have to use lethal force. You're authorized to use up to lethal force. And the same thing holds true with any other item on the continuum. So if somebody came up with an aggressive physical, and what aggressive physical means is if somebody takes a fighting stance, if somebody went and, and tried to strike an officer, kick an officer, that would be aggressive physical resistance. So on the continuum, if you look down, you could use a less lethal projectile weapon, which would be a taser. It could be a less than lethal weapon, OC spray. It could be empty hand control techniques, which may just be grabbing maybe a wrist lock or something else, or it could just be verbal commands. So the continuum allows you to flow back and forth and tells you what the maximum amount you can use for any given situation. And we go to the next slide. The vascular neck restraint. That is one that is a very hot issue and an issue that's been openly discussed in the media and in other forums. And there's a distinction, and it's a fine distinction, between a chokehold 
and a vascular neck restraint. A chokehold technically blocks off the airway and prevents somebody from breathing. A vascular neck restraint doesn't affect the airway. It's supposed to be done on both sides of the neck and reduces blood flow to the brain, which will temporarily incapacitate the person. And as soon as you release it, they should come right back up. In the George Floyd case, and I don't have firsthand knowledge, it's from media reports and everything else, they attempted to do a vac vascular neck restraint. And in Minnesota, they allowed for it to be done either with an arm or with a knee. In the Fort Walton Beach Police Department, when I first got here, the vascular neck restraint was an allowable use of force. What I did was I greatly restricted it at the time to only be allowed if other levels of force failed, if you tased somebody, sprayed them, and there are cases where if somebody is extremely high on drugs, that they may have no concept of pain compliance, and most of our less lethal options work off pain compliance, that they may fail. And we only allowed it to be applied for 15 seconds. Because when you talk to the defensive tactics experts, that within five to 10 seconds, you should be effective. If it is not effective within 15 seconds, it's not properly applied, you're not restricting the blood flow, you're probably at the windpipe and restricting air flow and not blood flow. Due to the community concerns with the, with the technique, the president's executive order, we just completely did away with it. Even though the vascular neck restraint is not a chokehold, and it would probably still be allowable under the executive order, we said no, nothing around the neck. There will be no chokeholds, no neck restraints, or anything else. So they're all now prohibited under our new policy, which we updated a few days ago. So we have no longer have a vascular neck restraint, and we've never had any type of chokehold. And you can see the only caveat in there is when deadly force is authorized. And if deadly force is authorized, almost any type of force is authorized at that point. The next slide is use of force reporting. Every incident where force is used within the city of Fort Walton Beach Police Department requires two separate reports. It will be documented in the police report, and there will be a separate internal document which will dictate how the force was used, why the force was used, conditions when the force was used, that word that we used before, the totality of the circumstances. Those two reports will go through every level of the chain of command all the way up to the desk of the chief of police. And there'll be recommendations made at every level in the chain of command, whether the force was within policy and within state law, or not within policy or not within state law. If there's corrective measures that have to be taken, we will take corrective measures. If we see that there's a policy deficiency or a training issue, we will fix our policy. Just like when I saw the vascular neck restraint was probably being used when I first got here and insist in incidents where it should not have been used, we reformatted the policy to restrict its use. And now, like I said, we changed the policy where there is no longer a vascular neck restraint. The same thing with use of force reporting. Our use of force is dynamic, and it will change as it needs to be changed or as conditions change either within the community, as laws change, as feedback we get from the community. Our policies are fluid and can be changed when they need to be changed. Nothing is written in stone. So with the use of force, it goes all the way up to the chief of police. If we had a serious use of force incident, a discharge of a firearm, serious bodily injury, maybe a subject goes to the hospital, critical condition, those investigations are turned over to FDLE. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement would come in. And the Florida Department of Law Enforcement would do the investigation. We would never see the investigation as a local agency. It'd be sent to the state attorney's office. The state attorney's office would render findings if criminal charges or not would be filed. And then at the end of it, we get a copy of the investigation to look over for policy issues. So there may be a policy violation. There may not be something that rises to a criminal violation, but there could be something that rises to a policy level violation. So that's for use of force. You can go to the next slide. Citizen complaint process. So if there was something that happened, a use of force incident, a search that you didn't believe was lawful, discourtesy complaint, any type of complaint, you should ask to speak to an on-duty supervisor or you should come to the station and request to speak to an on-duty supervisor or fill out a complaint form. 
every complaint is routed to our administrative sergeant. The administrative sergeant will do a preliminary investigation into the complaint. If it is a complaint of a serious nature, it's gonna to go to our internal affairs. If it is a complaint of a minor nature, it may be a vehicle that cuts somebody off in traffic, something of a very minor offense, it will be given to a, a supervisor on one of the shifts to investigate. But every complaint will be investigated and every complaint should come back to the complaint with some type of findings. There could be some complaints that when it gets investigated, the officer may have acted within policy, and then that will be explained to the complainant. You can go to the next slide. The next slide basically talks about what I talked about with the lethal force or serious bodily injury with FDLE, the state attorney, and then the police department. So we can skip to the next slide. We get a lot of questions about public records requests and how you can get information, whether if you wanna see how many complaints were filed, what the resolution of a complaint was, numbers of crimes, any type of information. Almost anything in Florida government, whether it's from the police department, from the city government, the county government, the state government, is open for public records requests. At the police department, you can make it in person or you can make it on our website. There can be some fees involved for basically the cost of photocopying the paper. The fees are minor. And like I said, almost any record is available to the public. There are a few exceptions. If there's an open and active investigation, that will not be released to the public because it could jeopardize the resolution of the investigation. But once the investigation is completed, that information will be then released to the public. Internal affairs investigations are confidential until they're completed to ensure the integrity of the investigation. Once they are completed, they are open for public examination. We can go to the next slide. So, and some of the slide was actually based off some of the questions that I'm gonna read next. So demographics was some of the questions that had come up and is a topic that comes up nationally. So we looked at the demographics of the city of Fort Walton Beach. And it's about 76% white, 12% black, 4% Asian, 11% Hispanic, and about 6% of people, and this is census data, that reported mixed race. So I give you that as just a base as we start talking about some of the other numbers. You go to the next slide. Calls for service. People sometimes ask, how many calls does the Fort Walton Beach Police Department go on, or how busy are you guys? You can see that we've averaged right around 40,000 calls every year with a slight dip in 19, and at 15 for the first probably five months, we were at 15,000, so we're probably on pace to break 40,000 again for call volume. And you can see the decrease in the call numbers. When we looked into the decrease in the call numbers, the calls from the citizens were actually going up. Some of the self-initiated activities from the officers were going down. And part of the explanation, there's probably confounding variables in there, was that for a period of time, we had a lot of open vacancies so the officers basically only had time to respond to citizen-generated calls and probably didn't have as much time for traffic stops and other things that they may have come about through the day. So that explains some of the decrease in the call volume. If you go to the next slide, it talks about arrest numbers. And that was one of the questions that I'll be going over in my 22 questions. So when you look at the arrest numbers, and we'll look at 2019 data, you can see that 553 of the arrests were of white people, males and females, which was approximately 71% of the arrests. Blacks made up 90, 194 arrests, which was approximately 25% of the numbers. And then you can see the other categories were extremely small there, 0 or 1%. And like I said, I'll talk more about arrest numbers when I answer the 22 questions. In citations, if you go to the next slide, you can see the same thing. In 2019, we wrote 850 citations which was about 66% of them went to white individuals, and 244, or 19%, went to black individuals, and then you can see the breakdown for the other ethnicities. And like I said, I will go more into that as I answer the 22 questions, and you can see the citation numbers as you look across are fairly consistent for the years. We, we went back five years, and it's pretty much 68, 66, 69. They're all in the upper 60s for white, 
for black, they're all right around 20, between 19 and 20 percent. So those numbers are fairly consistent for the five-year sampling that we pulled for this presentation. If you go to the next one, it talks about use of force by race. And you can see that in 2018, 46 percent, or 46, that these aren't percentages, they're actually numbers. 46 were white, 10 were black, 2 were Hispanic. In 2019, it was 14 white, 10 black, and 1 Hispanic. And now in 2020, it was 6 white, 2 black, and none on Hispanic. So those are the demographics, and we included them in our presentation because there are questions in the 22 questions, and we wanted to be consistent when we gave the presentation to other groups. The one thing that I would caution on demographics, and I actually have some stats also on employment figures because that was one of the questions that was asked, is that when we talk of demographics, we're talking of the residents in the city of Fort Walton Beach. The city of Fort Walton Beach is 50% residential and 50% non-residential. So we have a great influx of people that come in from the outside. So at any given time, the percentages of people in Fort Walton may not match the census percentages of Fort Walton Beach. But we do look at those numbers as a base to see if anything is really out of a tolerance range or something that we would expect to see. And that's why we look at it based on our population and Okaloosa population. You just have to put a little bit of an asterisk by it and know that our population doesn't always match the census population. If we were a community that was 90% residential and maybe 10% non-residential, we would match the census breakdown a lot better but we have a big influx of tourism. We, get, we probably have one of the biggest working zip codes for all of Okaloosa County, so we import workers from other cities and other places. Our breakdown is about 50% residential property use and 50% non-residential property use. So our next slide, if you wanna to go to it, is community policing. So we listed out some of the highlights of the initiatives that we've done to try and start up some community engagement that was probably one of the things that I saw was lacking most when I came here was some of the engagement that we had within the community. And you can see some of the highlights we list out was Construction Junction, uh, Citizens Police Academy, which is something that we do once a year to try and get people an insight into the police department. Each week, uh, members of the public can come in and learn about a different aspect of policing, whether it's patrol, investigations, crime scene, uh, statistics, what analytics, what canine unit, whatever we do in the police department, each week is a different topic. For the first year this year, we're starting a junior cadet academy. So we partnered with the Parks and Recreation Department and we asked basically if we could take over a week of their summer program and do a junior police cadet program so we can actually reach out to the youth of the community and try and give them some insight on how policing works. We did coffee with a cop. We actually did chill with a cop where we went to a Bippy's ice cream and sat down there and when people came in we struck a deal with Bippy's where they could get a free ice cream cone sit down with an officer and ask whatever they wanted to ask just have a simple conversation if they wanted to ask them how their day went or what they do after work they could ask questions like that if they wanted to ask tough questions about policing and why they do stuff and how they do it they could ask tough questions there was no rules just come down and have an ice cream cone and talk with an officer uh, we did Team Up with a Cop. It was a program that we started just before the COVID. We're at the rec center and also at the Boys and Girls Club where we would play sporting events with different kids that would show up at the two facilities. We've done food drives and we actually passed out a kid MREs. There was a group that donated basically snacks to us, prepackaged snacks. And we took that out into the community to pass out during the COVID when kids were out of school and we didn't know how much access they may have had to food and nutrition, which also try to help out and pass out some snacks in the community. Uh, community policing outreach continued on the next slide. During the COVID was a unique time for us. We didn't want to pause our community interaction, but we had to maybe change our community interaction a little bit. So we started doing COVID parades. People would tell us that so-and-so's birthday party was canceled, or we'd go by the nursing homes, and we just do small parades down the street or around the nursing home just to try and make people feel that they're still included as part of the community and maybe break that feeling of isolation just for a few minutes. So we did a bunch of birthday and special events parades. We attended community meetings at a much smaller level and some of them were done like we are doing now with Zoom and other mechanisms. 
Prior to the COVID, we did reading with a cop and we did reading pals where we'd go at the library and actually read with individual kids and individual students because one of the best indicators of possible criminality later in life is reading scores. The better reading score you have, the more successful you're probably gonna be in life. It doesn't always hold true, it's a correlation. So we really wanted to get involved in reading programs. And the other thing, the last thing listed on there is school men mentorship. We took five of our officers, which is about 10% of our department, and put them through a actual mentoring program with the Okaloosa County Schools and started mentoring in the schools just before the COVID. And the COVID kind of put a pause to that too, but it's something that we'll start again next year is mentoring in the schools. And those were just some of the highlights of the community events that we did. If you go to the next slide, you can see that we also participated in other community programs. We formed a DUI task force with Okaloosa County. And between us and Okaloosa County, we were able to get every single law enforcement agency in Okaloosa County, which had never been done before, including the military law enforcement agencies, to come together for a single goal. And that single goal was to make the streets safer by removing intoxicated drivers. We did safety checkpoints. We started a homeless outreach team where in the past, if we went to a homeless issue, we would try and deal with it in the here and now and basically just try to resolve the problem right there and then. With the homeless outreach team, what they do now is they follow up with the individuals. So if there was an individual that they came across in a park, behind a business, they may still have to tell the individual, hey, you cannot sleep behind this business. It is private property. If you come back, you'll be subject to arrest for trespass. When it boils down, we are still ultimately law enforcement officers, but we'll also tell the homeless person, here's a list of resources. And we came up with a two-page document that listed out every single resource available in Okaloosa County. In addition, we try to refer them directly to the Homeless Housing Alliance, which we have a strong partnership with, and then we try to follow up with the person. So the next three or four days later, a week later, depending on our schedule, we would go back to the area that either we found the person in or the area the person said they may be going to and ask them questions such as, were you able to get help? What happened when you went to this organization? Do they still provide food? Were you able to get assistance? Is there anything that we can do to help you? Do you need a ride somewhere? Are you going to the appointment? When is your follow-up appointment with whatever social service they went to? And we've tried to follow up with them as much as we can to provide the encouragement and maybe sometimes that little extra incentive for them to actually get some services and get off the street. Because that was our number one goal is to get them off the streets and get them into a safe environment. And then you can see we did burglary details and speed enforcement details. Speeding and traffic concerns is probably a Complaint that is from South Florida to North Florida. Traffic is a common complaint anywhere you go. And if you go to the next one, there are probably three big special events that we do. The Billy Bowl Lakes Festival, Christmas Parade, and Mardi Gras Parade. And you go to the next slide. So training, training is probably a key to policing. And it's something that has come out in the national conversations. It's something that we have to do. At the budget policy meeting, I made a very strong statement in front of the city council about the need for training and police training. And I can tell you the city of Fort Walton Beach has always provided enough resources to properly train the police department and provide training to the police department. But now, probably more so than ever, training is a critical role in policing. Training, supervision, and engagement of the community are probably the three pillars of policing that we have to focus on in the modern age of policing. And for training, you can see the first one up there is implicit bias training. Implicit bias are subconscious biases that everybody has, whether you're male, female, black, white, Hispanic. And the, the, the interesting thing about implicit biases is that they're not unique by race, that people of different races may have the same implicit biases because they really come about through culture and through how you grow up and who you interact with and how you interact, not so much of who, what genetics you come from. It's more with the nurturing side of the equation of how you're brought up. So implicit bias training that we did, we got an outside company to come in and there's a training course called Fair and Impartial Policing. And Fair and Impartial Policing makes you aware that these implicit biases exist 
They give you some exercises that you can kind of go through yourself to determine what implicit biases you may have and tell you that some of this stuff will dictate how you make decisions. And for some officers, it was very eye-opening, and they do a self-examination, and hopefully it changes their outset on a lot of stuff. The training was also then incorporated in some of the, our policies and some of our future trainings. We didn't just train once and done, we continued the mindset and then what we learned from the implicit bias training, which goes to the next one, which is CIT training. CIT is something that has been around for a while. CIT is for when you go into a crisis intervention training. So it tells you how to deal with people in crisis, how to de-escalate, how to maybe speak to somebody that's not thinking rationally, because a lot of the encounters we deal with, especially with mental health issues, is that everybody in this room may look at it as a rational person, but somebody that is thinking or acting irrational sees things differently or responds differently than a rational person would. And it's to kind of give the officers the awareness that, yeah, they may be doing something, but they're not doing it as you may perceive that they're doing it. They're probably doing it because they're not properly thinking through like a normal person would. A lot of it has to do with autism, where an autistic person may sometimes mimic actions when somebody does something. So they may not be threatening you if they see your hands go up. They're just mimicking those actions because your hands went up, their hands went up. Or if you reach for your radio, they may reach in a similar spot on their body. They're not reaching for something. They're merely mimicking your actions. So crisis intervention training does a lot for mental health response. The thing that we're doing currently in the department is ICAT, which is Integrated Communications and Tactics. So we're taking everything we have learned. We're taking our defensive tactics, we're taking our communications, and putting everything together and making a foundation of communications, where we want to communicate first and then act with other options if needed be, if need be. And today and two weeks ago, and we'll do it one more time because we're gonna do the whole department's going through it. The final part of the ICAT class is actually scenario based where the officers go in, and hopefully none of the officers are watching tonight, because in these scenarios, the only way you successfully can complete the scenario is not by using force. So when you first walk in, in one of the scenarios, somebody has a knife, there's another one where the person is verbally combative. In each one of the scenarios, the proper final response is to de-escalate the situation and either use your surroundings, back out, request additional resources, separate the two parties. Each one of them has a possible peaceful resolution to the situation to demonstrate to the officers that there's always a chance of a peaceful resolution if you go through the proper options and the proper course. We all, every year we do diversity training. So we talk about cultural diversity to ensure that officers understand that People come from different backgrounds, and something that you may be consider a norm may not be a norm for someone else. We do citywide leadership training, and through the sales tax that was passed, we were able to buy a use of force simulator that we can then actually put officers into situations. And if the pastor, if anybody else wants to come by and see our use of force simulator, we can make appointments for somebody to come by and see it. You can go through a scenario and depending on how you interact with the scenario, we can change the outcome. If you come in there and you don't give the proper verbal commands or you miss certain verbal cues, the situation can escalate. If you hit the proper verbal cues and you do the proper vocalizations, you can de-escalate the situation and it can be completely resolved. Some scenarios do require the use of force and the simulator allows an officer to go in there with their exact equipment. They can go in with their gun, they can go in with their pepper spray, they can go in with their taser, their flashlight. The ones that are at night, you can only see where the flashlight shines. It is as close to real life that we can get to without actually having role players and everything else. And it allows us to run multiple officers through multiple times and really reinforce the other training courses that I had spoken about. You can go to the next slide. So the next slides have a bunch of small print. They're basically the training courses I talked about. The first one is CIT, so you can skip that one. And the next one is ICAT. And then we talk about 
annual training. If we're up to that slide, every year FDLE requires us to do annual training where we talk about defensive tactics, weapons qualification, bloodborne pathogens, domestic violence, use of force training, and other mandatory items. And I skipped the first one on the list, which is bias-based policing, that we have to train in bias-based policing. And then we have continuing education as our final slide. And that was the formal presentation that was prepared by Sergeant Dustin Rosenberg. And now, Pastor and Les, I mean, I can go to the 22 questions, or do you want me to take questions that are in the audience first? Oh, you're in charge. We're your guests, so you tell us what you want to do. I'm good. And I'll start off with one quick question. Uh, because we're in an area where we're uh, surrounded by multiple police departments, you know, we got Cinco, I got, they got a little department. Shalomar got a little department. Then we got the sheriff working in certain areas. Then we got you guys. How consistent are the policies of all the departments? Meaning that you just told me your guys are going to do this, this, and this in the de-escalation or the type training. But when I go through a stop in Shalomar, is that guy going to give me the same courtesy? Or is it depending on the chief of that particular police department? I mean, that's a good question. That is one of the strengths and weaknesses with policing in the U.S. There are 18,000 law enforcement agencies in the U.S. Of them, not every single one operates the same way. So there could be a difference between Fort Walton Beach and Shalimar. There could be a difference between Cinco's run by the Sheriff's Department, but Crestview. Each police department is unique to itself. And when you see something that happened in one police department, and I've had conversations with people in the community, I ask them if their questions come from the national narrative or from the local narrative from something that they've seen that occurred here within their local police department. And it's hard, and we try to reach out to the chief of Shalimar, or the chief of Niceville, the chief of Crestview, and compare notes with them and tell them, hey, this is what we're doing. We have an outstanding relationship with the sheriff's department. So I can tell you that the sheriff's department bounces their policies off us. We bounce our policies off the sheriff's department. It's not done at a formal level. It may be done informally where we call somebody over there, somebody over there will call us to see if we're on the same page. But because they do something, it doesn't obligate us to do something. And because we do something, it doesn't obligate them to do anything because each one is truly independent. Well, now the president in his executive order tried to rein that in a little bit by requiring any police department that receives federal funds, grant funds, other federal funds, to go for accreditation. Accreditation is kind of the leveling of the playing field. So accreditation had always been voluntary. Now there's an incentive to become accredited because if you wanna get some of that federal grant money and most departments take some type of federal grant money because our budgets are extremely tight. So we need either money for personnel, we need money for equipment, we need money for training. We need funding in the police department. So we apply for federal grants. Well, now those federal grants, if we apply for them, we either have to be in the process of accreditation, and accreditation, you can't be in the process forever. They give you a timeline. When we reapply for accreditation, we have to tell them that we're complete and ready for inspection within about a year. We can ask for an extension, but within about a year, we have to say, hey, we're ready to go. Now, we might not get inspected the next day. It might still be a month or two until they send the inspectors in, but we have to tell them we're ready. When you become accredited, Every three years, you have to go back for reinspection. If you're not accredited, before there really wasn't a lot to incentivize you becoming accredited, but now there are incentives to become accredited, the federal grant money. Now that could extend further. Maybe the state makes it for state grant money. Maybe there are other requirements. Maybe at some point the state requires it, just like the state regulates officer certifications. The amount of training we have to do, the amount of retraining we have to do. Maybe at some point accreditation becomes mandatory for law enforcement agencies. And if you asked 100 police chiefs, there may be some differencing of opinion of whether accreditation is the proper way to go or whether you can do better without being accredited because there will be a few police chiefs that will say, it restricts me from being the most responsive to the community, that there may be some accreditation standards that don't particularly apply to the panhandle of Florida that may apply to southern Florida, a more urban environment. We're a more rural community. 
that you may have some debate of the validity of accreditation, but for my first day here, I knew that was one thing that we had to get back because I'd like to see some standardization across the law enforcement agencies. One of the things that we can do, and it's by coming to meetings like this, and if pressure is put on other police departments, we can have more formal meetings between the leaders of the police departments. Maybe monthly we sit down and we go over issues and try to get to a similar page. We may not be on the same page. Maybe it's almost like religion where you have Baptists and Methodists and when you boil it all down, they're all very similar still. They all still believe in the same tenements and but how they practice is slightly different. Policing needs to maybe come to that same understanding where we may still have our unique identity as the Fort Walton Beach Police Department. Crestview may be slightly different. Shalimar may be slightly different. Maybe we want to engage, we want to engage more in community policing. Maybe Crestview wants to engage more in a traditional policing model where you respond to calls, you investigate, and you drive home. There's different models that are there, and each community should dictate and drive which model of policing do they want. And the way you get that done is by what we're doing right now, is by becoming involved, is through engagement, is when decisions are being made, make it known to the policy makers, this is what we want to see. We want to see this type of policing. We want to see this level of policing. We want to see this done with the police department. And the police departments are responsive to the community. They may not steer instantly, it may be like trying to turn a cruise ship, it may take a little bit of time and a little bit of effort to get it changed, but they are responsive to the local community if the local community is involved and engaged in what goes on. So it's something I'd like to see done is a more standardization across the board. Thank you. Yes, I have uh, one, uh, one question. You, sh you talked about due to intervene, but you didn't show any statistics locally if you had officers actually implemented that due to intervene in some of the uh, cases? I can tell you we really don't have any statistics for it. We've had that policy probably for 13, 14 months now. It was one of the ones when we rewrote our use of force policy when I came here, we added the duty to intervene. We could maybe go back and review incidents and everything else to see, but I can also tell you on the flip side we haven't had any sustained complaints of excessive force either. And in the year that I've, over a year that I've been here, we've had no complaints from the community about excessive use of force either. So if we have no complaints of excessive use of force from the community, and we have none that we generated internally, there really wouldn't be any duty to intervene statistics to report either. So as time goes on, and it's something that if a use of force complaint was generated, we would then at that point review all the evidence at hand, body camera videos, statements from other officers, statements from witnesses, physical evidence. And at that point, we could determine if somebody violated their duty to intervene. So we're not to that point yet, but know that it exists. And if we got into an incident where somebody didn't intervene, we would hold them responsible at at least a department level. They'd be held responsible for not intervening. Any other questions from the live audience? So Pastor, I'll read, I guess, maybe a few of these because there's a lot of questions here. I don't know if they're watching at home or anywhere else. And then maybe at some point, if you want, you can break me and I can take some Zoom questions or something. Okay. Because I don't know if the people that wrote these 22 questions are here or if they're around or... So I'll start with the, the first question is, how would you describe the overall strengths of the department? So I think one of our overall strengths is our responsiveness. We are a very responsive police department. If you come in, if you have a concern, we will address it. The pastor can tell you I've come to several of the African-American community leaders meetings. I've learned a lot by coming to those meetings. I take stuff back from the meetings that if you come with us and if there's a something that you wanna see done, if you come, we are a very responsive police department. So I think that's one of our strengths is our responsiveness. I think the other strength that we have is that I can speak for myself and I think the other officers would say the same thing. Our officers are proud to be Fort Walton Beach police officers. 
I think you go, can go to some departments, and I don't think there are any local departments, but I think you go to some departments and you'll see officers that are not really proud to work at their agencies for various reasons. But I think the, the support we've gotten from the community, the support they get from the city government, and everything else, I think that's one of our strengths too, is that we have officers that really want to be here and make a difference in the city of Fort Walton Beach. So that was the first one, and it was actually a two-part question. It says, what are some of the areas that you have identified as growth opportunities when it comes to community relations? And I think it's just engagement. We want to be able to have open dialogues with groups. We'd much rather sit down or across from a table. These questions that were given to me, they weren't really necessary. I really just would have liked to have come here and just had a conversation with the people in the room and just ask, hey, how does this happen? Why does that happen? How did that happen? And I think why is one of the questions that never really gets answered or even asked. So you may know where we did something, you may know when we did something, you may know how we did it, but a lot of times I don't think the why is discussed is why were we there? How did we get the initial call? What had gone on before whatever incident took place? Why were those tactics used? What other options were available? I think the why sometimes doesn't get answered or asked. So I would say community engagement is one of the things where we have a lot of room for growth. The second question, researchers and organizational leadership and development have often said, if you want to see an organization's values, look at their budget. How does your annual budget reflect your commitment to diversity, equality, and inclusion within the department and among those who you serve and protect? So we have an extremely flat budget. It doesn't have a lot of resources dedicated to programs. The majority of our budget is personnel and operations. But we always look for ways in which we can partner with the community or leverage our existing resources to accomplish some type of engagement or activity to bring the community together or to emphasize our inclusion of the community. Because we want to be the police department for all of Fort Walton Beach from all the way from the furthest west point to the furthest east point, all the way up north, all the way down south, we want to be able to represent the whole community, and we want the whole community to be able to say, that's my police department. We want everybody in the, in the city to really recognize us as being their police department and have pride the same way that we have pride amongst ourselves, we want the community to have the same pride of their police department. So with our budget being relatively flat, some of the stuff that I outlined in the formal presentation, we look for ways to partner with nonprofits, we with the United Way, with the Homeless Housing Alliance, with the Boys and Girls Club, Destin Harvest, Greg Chapel. we participated in an after-school tutoring program. Anything that when somebody comes to us, we look for a way where we can partner with them and really reach out into the community. So a lot of it is done ad hoc. A lot of it you won't see in our budget because unfortunately we don't have a line in our budget for community engagement. We don't have a line in our budget for community initiatives. It's something that maybe one day we can get to that point, but as of right now, our biggest thing that we can give to the community is some of our manpower and some of our resources or maybe some of our expertise. If you have a food drive and you need help, we're more than welcome to come by here and help out on the food drive. So I'll go to the third question. Currently, many strategies and philosophies of policing are being discussed. Can you describe your philosophy on policing and the ways in which you evaluate the effectiveness of these strategies and emphasize on practices and metrics? So that's a very long question, and I wrote a very long response, but I think a lot of it had been covered, what we talked about, but I'll go over it very quickly. Policing is a complex and challenging profession. People call the police when they cannot solve a problem or when other systems or institutions had failed. The police cannot choose to ignore problems. If a school has a problem with a kid, they can suspend or expel the child. If a business has a problem with somebody, they can call the police and ask them to be trespassed or removed. Mental health facilities can refuse to accept people. One of the only professions that have to deal with every problem that is presented to us is the police department. So my main philosophy when it comes to that, and it's one that you'll hear a lot of departments talk about, is community policing. Community policing would be the philosophy that I would embrace. And community policing is partnering with the community like we talked about with our homeless outreach team. So when we come across somebody that maybe had fallen through the cracks with traditional policing methods, 
that maybe we can identify a nonprofit or a social service agency or something else that can happen. But I'd like to take community policing to the next level or maybe even back it up a level to community engagement because I think it starts with the engaging of the community. Because we can list out all these different programs and give you this long slide presentation, but if we don't engage in the community and we don't know what the community wants from us, then in turn, we can't deliver to the community what they need, and there'll always be that disconnect. So we may be thinking that we're doing a great job, but in reality, we may miss the boat and completely not satisfy the community. In 1829, Sir Robert Peel stated, public approval of their existence, actions, and behavior, and their ability to secure and maintain public respect is the forefront of policing. So he spoke about policing in those terms. And I think that still holds true today, that we have to be able to secure and maintain the public's respect if we want to build legitimacy in the communities. Then when they talk about matrix, and we record and we report on everything, what's hard to get with matrix Matrix give a lot of times quantity and outputs. They don't give quality and outcomes. So we can tell you how many arrests we made, how many tickets we wrote. Those are all quantities and they're all outputs. They're not outcomes. An outcome would be if we solve the speeding problem. An outcome if there is a reduction in the number of homeless people on the street. Those are outcomes. And a lot of times statistical comparison of outputs really don't tell you the quality of the outcome. So we can report on everything and anything. And just to give some real quick numbers, we had a big reduction in part one crimes. Part one crimes are the most serious crimes. They're your rape, your robbery, your murder, your theft, your auto burglary, and your structure burglaries. There's six crimes that make up part one crimes. We saw a 24% reduction in part one crimes between 2018 and 2019. That is a big reduction in crime, to see a 24% reduction in crime. One of the other things that when we saw that reduction in crime, we also saw a 69% reduction in the use of force. We had 72 incidents in 2018 compared to 22 incidents in 2019. So we had a 69% reduction in use of force. Generally, when you see a big reduction in use of force, it correlates with a slowdown in work. There's less arrests made, less calls going out, everything else. When you saw our stats, our call numbers were fairly flat, and our arrest numbers were also almost the same. We made 735 arrests compared to 732 arrests. So statistically, they're basically flat. So our use of force went down. We tried to figure out why did our use of force go down, and there's many confounding variables in there. Our changed our use of force policy, philosophies in the department, training that we gave, and it could have just been that we dealt with different clientele, that we were responding to different types of calls. There's certain types of calls, domestics, that there's a greater likelihood for force to be used. So it would really take a holistic analysis to really find out why the use of force went down. Uh, clearance rate, we increased our current clearance rate by 9%, from 20% to 29%. The statewide average for clearance rate is 25%. Those are the numbers of serious crimes that are actually solved. So those are just some of the matrix. Did you want to interject with something? Well, before you go to the next question, I want to uh, read a couple from online. Oh, that's so, fine. so those folks who are online will at least know that we acknowledge their question. Okay. And since you said you've answered all the 25 or 22 that we sent you, if we don't finish those, we can get your answers and we can post those on our communication system. So one question online says, uh, how do you find out which departments are accredited? Is there a national database or something you can go to? Yes, you can. If you search, I mean, you could easily search in Google, Florida Police Accreditation. The accrediting, there's two accrediting bodies in Florida. There's CFA and there's CALEA. And so you can either search those acronyms, CALEA or CFA. Or if you just put, like I said, if you put in police accreditation in Google, it'll come up. CALEA is a national group that does accreditation, and CFA is a state-run group that does accreditation. Both are probably equivalent to each other. So if you search, and most agencies, if they are accredited, they are very proud that they're accredited. So they're going to display it on their website, on their car, on their uniform. So if an agency is accredited, you're probably not going to miss that they're accredited. 
Good. And another question online has to do with something that you said about the why. Uh, it says, can you please give an example of when, when, the, when you notice the why not being asked? I can give you a why, a very relevant why, and I think I could probably think of some other. Mr. Davis was an incident that was reported in the newspaper. He was shot by a crossbow in the head as he was riding his bicycle. So we got a lot of inquiries into the charges that were filed in the case. And people wanted to know how come he was only charged, the subject was only charged with aggravated battery and not attempted murder. So why he was charged with only aggravated battery, not attempted murder in the case, was that as soon as the case occurred, we started investigating it. We were able to locate the suspect probably within about a day and a half at most from when the incident occurred. He was in a hotel room. We took the evidence we had at the time in the case and presented it to the state attorney's office because we needed to get a warrant to get into the hotel room and effect the arrest. We didn't want to wait for him to walk out of the hotel room and try and catch him on the street or something else. We wanted to get into the hotel room. So when we presented the evidence to the state attorney's office, at that point in time, they were believed that the evidence was sufficient for an aggravated battery warrant. So we got an aggravated battery warrant. We continued our investigation, conducted, researched his, the suspect's Facebook, additional interviews, collected additional evidence in the case, and stayed in contact with the state attorney's office because at the time of arrest, the case was not over. And today, the charges were upgraded to first degree attempted murder and a hate crime because we were able to establish enough cause to also have the state attorney's office have, uh, prosecute a hate crime. So some of that, that may not be an exactly in a why, but that comes to maybe some of the process that goes on beneath the surface that some people may not know that it was that balancing act that we wanted to get him off that person with the crossbow off the street as soon as we could. Now, could we have argued with the state attorney's office, maybe delayed it a few hours, maybe delayed it a day? Probably. But we wanted to get that person off the street as soon as we could and then come back and enhance the charges and complete the investigation. And it's that balancing act. Some of the why, another example for the why could be a, you may see officers writing a bunch of tickets somewhere. And it may be because that's a high traffic crash location and we're not out there trying to make revenue for the city because traffic citations bring back very little money to the city. The majority of the money goes back to the court and to the state and to the county. The why behind something like that may be that's a location where there's a lot of traffic crashes and that's why we are there doing speed enforcement, stop signs, red lights or whatever else, that generally there's something that brings us to a location if you see some type of static location. Uh, there was an individual that came in and wanted to know why a SWAT team served a warrant and broke down a door. It was because a person had a kidnap warning and a false imprisonment warrant out for him. And when somebody has serious charges, we're not gonna go as slow or as easy because of the severity of the charges, things are proportional. So I think some of those whys may not be discussed or may not be known. And the pastor stepped out so I guess I'll go back, unless you, you got the questions? Okay. You want me to repeat it for you? Oh, okay, that's fine. We can hear you. Okay, um, my, 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 my question is uh, two. Is there a time to file a complaint? What's, what's the policy about filing complaints? I got issued a $300 uh, ticket at Eglin Parkway in Hollywood behind that gas station for a uh, traffic sign at that stop sign by one of your uh, officers that was sitting across the street from me looking at me and uh, involved with that traffic. He wrote me a three hundred dollar ticket. What's the not reasonable time limit to file? I mean, that's just for future reference. The other one is let's talk about that lethal force on national on on uh, national TV. In a lot of cases, we see black men getting shot in the back. That's our main concern when we be looking at this film footage. What's the uh, policy?
policy about lethal force when it comes to situations like that? Those are my two questions. Thank you. Well, for the first question, if you get a traffic citation that you think is invalid, your first recourse should be to challenge it in court, that that's the proper recourse for any time you get a traffic ticket that you believe is improperly issued, is to take it to court and have an independent body basically adjudicate whether the violation occurred or did not occur. So the courts would be the proper disposition for that type of dispute between a officer and a traffic violation. If the officer did something during the traffic violation, discourtesy, anything like those means, then you would come to the department, speak with the supervisor, fill out a complaint form, and it'd be investigated by a supervisor. But for traffic complaints generally, the court is the proper recourse. For the use of force, there was a use of force question that came up in here, and I could find it if we wanted to combine the two. But I can tell you that the use of force, unless you know the question number, Okay. The use of force goes to what we talked about in our formal presentation while she looks for the question number, is that the force that is used by an officer has to be reasonably necessary to bring about lawful means of compliance. So every situation is different and every situation is unique. So that's why we have the continuum. That's why we talk about de-escalation. That's why we talk about the sanctity of life. And you have to look at the totality of the situation. Can someone lawfully be shot in the back? There could be situations. I can tell you in Miami Beach, because I used to work down in Miami, there was a Miami Beach officer that was in a foot chase. The subject shot at the beach officer behind his head like that, struck the officer and killed the officer, and the officer fired back and hit the subject in the back. So there are rare incidents where something like that could occur. But everything is looked at the totality of the circumstances, and the officers are held to a standard, and it's not just a, for Walton Beach, you asked about national standards and everything else. For use of force, the national standard for use of force is objective, objective reasonableness. That it's what an objective force, objectively you have to look at it, and what is reasonable for an officer to use for the totality of the circumstances. So if you got an officer, would it be reasonable, and the court is ultimately the trier of that, is what is reasonable or not reasonable, and you go in front of a court, and the judge will say, yes, that was reasonable, that was not reasonable. And that is the ultimate determination of what is reasonable and not reasonable. What is the question number? And I'll read. So that's question number 17, but um, okay. can I also read you a question that's also along the same lines as use of force? Correct, you can. Okay, so there's an online question and then question number 17. So online question says, did any of your officers come from other departments um, that had fired them because of their use of force, because of a sex, a excessive use of force? Not that I know of. Many of the officers, and I look back in their files, there are none that I know of that had come either before I got here or any that I hired since I've been here that have been fired from other departments for use of force. One of the questions in here, and we can get to that one too, that it talks about police reform and what things I would like to see come out of police reform. And one of the things that are being talked about is a national database for law enforcement officers. Currently in Florida, when you get hired and when you leave an agency, it's documented in a statewide database. And in the statewide database, there has to be a reason for separation. So if you're separated, is this voluntary, retirement, under investigation, because of investigation, failed to meet standards. There's several re uh, disposition codes, almost like in the military when you get a separation code. So in Florida, it's very easy to find out if an officer got hired somewhere and why the officer left whatever agency they were at. When you go to other states, there is no central depository like that. So if an officer tells us, hey, I worked at two departments and left off a third department, Unless through our background investigation, we can flush out that third department. Maybe they listed it on one of the two other applications. Maybe when we talked to a character reference, they said, oh yeah, he worked at A, B, and C. If we can flush out there at that third department, we'll then go to that third department and find out why they left that third department. But we probably won't even go that far because generally when people leave stuff off our application, that is probably the number one reason we disqualify people 
from our applications. So they'll leave off an employer, they'll leave off that something happened somewhere. So generally, if you leave something off your application, you're gonna be disqualified from employment with the city of Fort Walton Beach Police Department. So we'd like to see a national database that would mimic the Florida database so we could put in a name and then know, okay, you were hired at these three agencies, here's the three reasons you left from these three agencies. In addition, if the database was to go a level further and log excessive use of force complaints, that would only benefit us as we try to hire and try to screen through applicants. So we would not be opposed to anything like that. And then I'll jump into, you said question 17. Question 17 says, in your current use of force continuum, is the carotid artery hold still in place? And what are your thoughts about its use? So we talked about that in our presentation, is that it's no longer in place and it's no longer used. And I think there was a more explicit question that talked about use of force in the question. So if you want to look through the questions, we can find that one out, unless you have another online question. I have some questions that are addressing the, um, the complaint process. Okay. Um, one that says, uh, what does the FLLE mandate? Is there a citizen's review board involved with the decision-making process regarding citizen complaints against an officer? And when a, when a complaint um, is filed against an officer and it's substantiated, um, is the officer have to get required like more training like does he require training after that okay so it's two separate questions the first question for the citizen review board there is no citizen review board but as we said previously anybody can come and get any complaint once the complaint is closed out and it can still come out to public scrutiny and examination by making a public records request and it can still be discussed for the finding if an if a complaint is sustained what happens to the officer varies on what the complaint is for. Mm -hmm. A more severe complaint may require a reprimand, a suspension, or even termination, depending on how severe the complaint is. A minor complaint may go to some type of training or remedial instruction given to the officer, some type of counseling. So it all depends on the severity of the complaint that is received will dictate on what happens after the complaint is sustained. Um, <clears throat> I have a question on here about body cam, which also th there's another question on, on the 22, number 22, that's talking about body cams. Okay. And since I have that online as well as on the, on the uh, can we uh, go over that one? Okay. So the question 22 says, does all officers have body cameras? What are the protocols for using it? Should you turn it on immediately during engagement with a private citizen? So yes, we have body cameras. We've had body cameras for about three years now. The, officer, the officers have to activate them at time of dispatch. So it's actually prior to knocking on your door, prior to having inter interactions with you. And the reason we use a time of dispatch is that we don't want an officer pulling up, somebody come running out a door, something happens, and they just get involved in the heat of the moment and forget to activate the body camera. So it's at time of dispatch, or it's at time of engagement with, prior to taking some type of action. So if you're not dispatched to a call, but they see somebody coming out of a window holding a TV set, they then activate their body camera and then engage that person. Pretty much every encounter should be captured on body camera unless you maybe talk to an officer like in line at a fast food restaurant or some type of casual conversation. That may not be captured on body camera, but any type of official interaction with the police should be captured on body camera. The other question that we were looking for was question 18 which says, can you explain the average citizen, what does it mean when the police try to gain control of a situation? The question focuses on the level of force needed to control a situation. So that was the question I was looking oh, for. That's the one you're looking for. So if, so the situations we may use force, and I gave some examples, if two people are fighting, we may have to use force to separate them. If someone is threatening to use force against someone or against an officer, we may have to use force to stop them. Or if somebody does not want to voluntary, voluntarily comply, so if you have somebody that tenses, that braces, that grabs something, because a lot of people don't want to go to jail, and that they will, whether they intentionally mean to do it, if they just do it out of instinct, if they do it out of reflex, that you may encounter some level of resistance. So we have a use of force continuum, as we spoke about before. 
and directly out of our policy says officers may use the force which they reasonably believe necessary to defend themselves or others from bodily harm, affect lawful or affect the lawful objectives. And then it goes on to say, when feasible, officers will use de-escalation techniques and balance the totality of circumstances with the severity of the offense committed and the subject's level of resistance. So it's a little bit complex, but basically it goes back to what we talked about before, objective reasonableness, that you have to use the amount of force that if an objectable officer comes back in behind you and he goes in front of a court of law that they're going to determine is reasonable. If we changed our use of force policy, to give you an example, if I was up here, and I have to put the microphone down and talk a little bit low to it, but if I was up here holding this podium like this, you can't come in and beat me with an asp or something like that. In our old policy, you were able to tase me. We refined that a little bit now. And if somebody is just actively resisting, you have passive resistance is where I'm doing absolutely nothing. I'm just saying, I'm not going to jail, I'm not going to jail. Active resistance, I'm holding on to something, maybe I clinch up my fist, I hold out my arms like this and say, no, I'm not going, I'm not going. In those situations, you can still use bodily force. Maybe I try to force your arm behind you. You could use pepper spray, OC spray, uh, some type of pain compliance like that, but we no longer allow tasing in those situations. We've elevated our taser up to where it's now called aggressive. So if I go from the podium like this, and now I take a fighting stance, or I make threats to you to say, hey, if you come and arrest me, I'm gonna punch you square in your nose or something like that. So now it's elevated from just somebody tensing or bracing. So use of force is a very dynamic situation, and a lot of it comes through training and experience of the officers. And then, like I said, it gets reviewed all the way up the chain of command to the chief of police, and it's a constant feedback loop. So we train the officers if they use too much force or situations. There are even a few situations where an officer probably should have used force to prevent a fight from continuing or for something from happening to somebody else. So it could go in both directions and it's a continuous feedback loop. You have another online question? I, I do. Uh, goes along, a little bit goes along with uh, number 11. Okay. Okay, so we can go to number 11. And Pastor, you're responsible for keeping track of which questions we skip and which ones we do and everything else. <laughs> so number 11, the FBI has stated emphatically that law enforcement has been infiltrated by individuals that hold white supremacy views. What are the protocols to ensure that these individuals and views are not tolerated within the department? So she gave a big, long web link. And basically, I believe it comes out of a bulletin that the FBI put out in 2014. And the bulletin said that there was some intelligence that said that there are different groups that are trying to infiltrate law enforcement. It didn't have a lot of specifics to it. And it's something that we've always guarded against. And what I wrote to the response to that question is that we don't tolerate racist views in the department. We conduct an in-depth background investigation, which we talk to previous employers, neighbors, associates, and we run them through any available database that we have access to. And then we take it a step further, is we do a truth verification interview with the officers. We use a CVSA, which is very similar to a polygraph machine that you may see. And that's one of the questions that we ask them in this truth verification, is if you belong to any of these submersive groups. And they have to answer to us yes or no. So we try to verify that through the truth verification instrument and then through our background investigation. We talk to friends, neighbors, colleagues. Uh, we go to their high school if they're a recent high school graduate. I mean, we try to get as many sources of data that we can. We go to their neighborhood. We knock on neighbors' doors. If they're, if they're an out-of-town applicant, we send letters to their neighbors. And it's really like everything else we've spoken about, a lot of it hinges on the community's involvement that if we come and knock on a door, if we send you a letter, if you're an employer, if you don't provide us this information, then that's information that we're missing in our decision-making process. So we do the best we can to vet our applicants. And if we even discover it after we hire them, like I said, we don't tolerate any type of racist view within the department. Okay. <clears throat> Question on 
I want to have one question on here that kind of goes back to the question that we got from Zoom, okay. um, but it kind of asks very directly, um, when is it ever necessary to shoot someone in the back? If they're using deadly force against you. Like I said, where the person shot over his shoulder. So if you have somebody that shoots over their shoulder, uh, we could get into a very long discussion about perception and reaction time. Mm -hmm. That a threat could be posed to you. By the time it takes you to process that in your mind and the neural response to come and actually engage the subject and take whatever response with you, the person could actually be turning. And it's when you get into these discussions and both sides will bring experts and you're talking tens and hundreds of seconds, but it could happen. Generally, it's probably not appropriate to shoot somebody in the back, but there are incidents, like I said, if somebody was engaging you and they were facing this way and shooting sideways or over their back, you may have officers from different angles that if I'm confronting somebody on this side right here and they're confronting me back, you could have somebody at a different angle on how the person is standing or how they're bladed. There could be a lot of different what-if scenarios where you could justify something like that, but generally it's probably not going to be justified, but there are scenarios where it could be justified. And with anything that goes on, we have to keep an open mind as we start the investigation, and we have to allow the facts of every individual case to dictate the conclusion of each individual investigation and look at everything independent of itself and just the incidents of that fact and of that fact pattern. Okay. Yes, sir. All right, I got a couple questions. One is, uh, why do officers give uh, African Americans a hard time when they are stopped? That's, I, guess, I guess that's a general perception there. And I mean, I think that's a perception I mean, it's hard for me to answer that question because I've never given anybody a hard time when I stop them, no matter what the race or who they might be. And that may come from individual experiences. And you may just get the luck of the draw where you get a jerk officer to stop you. And whether you're white, black, or indifferent, you had a jerky officer stop you, and now you'll have a bad experience that goes forth. Some of it may come out historically because there are times, and I won't be naive to it, that if you were stopped and you were probably 30 years ago, 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, and maybe even today where there could be departments that treat people differently based on race. I mean, it's something that we try to, as best we can, flush out of the policing industry. I don't think there's any chief that would get up here and stand in front of anybody and say that it goes on or they endorse it or they're proud that it happens. And it's something that we work to change and overcome. I think body cameras help us out a lot because it holds both parties accountable. It holds the officer accountable to how the officer treated the person they stopped. It also holds the person that they stopped accountable to their actions of how they responded to the officer. So I think some of it goes both ways. And I think some of it may also come in that if you already have a negative connotation in your mind, the experience, no matter how it goes, may be negative at the end. So I think it's a lot of dynamics that go on and play in there. And I think by us coming and speaking in front of groups, the Citizens Police Academy, body cameras, diversity within the workforce. I mean, I can jump into that question right now because that was one of the things I was asked. So our workforce of sworn officers, because I broke it down by sworn and non-sworn, we have currently, as of today, because we've got these numbers as of today, 39 white officers, which is 81% of our department. We have seven black officers, which is 14% of our department, and two Hispanic officers, which make up about half a percent of our department. So when you look at the Okaloosa number and the Fort Walton Beach numbers, I mean, if you were just to purely just randomly pull numbers out and hire people, we are pretty much right there when we talked about Fort Walton Beach at the 12% in the beginning of the year presentation, we're at 14%. We never go out and say, we need one more of this race, we need one more of that race, we need one more of this person. We hire the best applicant, because that was another question that was posed. We hire the best person at the time. And at the time, if there's two candidates that came and we needed to diversify our ranks, or we wanted to diversify our ranks, we will favor to the side of diversity. 
but they have to be equally qualified. We're not going to take a lesser qualified applicant just to get a number, another number for our diversity. That we look at quality, the content of character, as Dr. King said, that we are about the content of the character of the person. And we look for the best person at the time. And by showing or sharing those numbers, it was asked, how do we ensure that we're actually doing what we say we do? And like I said, when we talked about traffic tickets, arrest citations, that it's good to look at those numbers to make sure we're not way out of balance. I wouldn't want to come here and say that our minority officers are 1% because then we'd be way out of balance. Right. But our numbers, just by normal hiring practices, are pretty much consistent with the community. And the biggest thing goes back to engagement again is that we need recruits. Recruiting is one of the hardest things we have to do. And if you really want to make a change, questions are great, dialogue is great, but come down and join the police department. Refer somebody to come down and join the police department and have them work within the department because the biggest change that can ever be made is from the inside. And if we get a more diversified pool of applicants to pick from, we will have a more diversified police force out there working in the community. And that may be part of the answer to this next question, uh, but it's spoken from a from a person asking about children. It says, how do we get our children prepared to become a member of the Fort Walton Beach Police Department? Different ways. I mean, we don't have an explorer program within the city of Fort Walton Beach. If somebody wants to become a police explorer, we refer them to the Okaloosa County Sheriff's Explorer Program. And from time to time, we've participated with them on activities and we have some involvement with them. We just looked at it from a logistic standpoint that we're not quite big enough and we don't draw from quite a big enough population to run our own Explorer program. So it works better for us to refer people to the Okaloosa County Sheriff's Department. And if we didn't think they had a good Explorer program, we would start our own Explorer program. But we, are, we think they have a great Explorer program, so we're happy to refer people to their Explorer program. And we try to participate in their Explorer program. The other thing we do is the mentoring. We talked about our five mentors that we send into the schools. We have a, we did recently did a public safety open house where people can come by the station. We do our construction junction event. We go to the schools. We do our reading pals in the school. We go to career days. We've had people just show up our front lobby and say, hey, my child would like to learn about policing. We'll pull an officer in. We'll, we'll show them the police cars. We had somebody that recently came to make a complaint about policing and they brought their daughter with them. And the individual said, my daughter wanted to be an officer, but now she no longer wants to be an officer. So we went through the complaint and they believed they had a valid complaint. But when we explained the why, like we spoke about, why certain things were done procedurally, why we may have to detain extra people when we're making arrests and not just when we go in and arrest one person, if there's three people in the room, why we may have to temporarily detain the other three, while we pull out that one person. We explained all the whys to them. They were actually very understanding of what happened. And that, that led into a conversation then where we took his daughter on a tour of the police department. And now she is back saying that she wants to become a police officer. So the opportunities are there. We just need people to engage with us. And we will reach out to anybody that wants to either have us, we've gone to Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, any group that if they want to have an officer come by and speak to their audience, we're ready to speak. Okay, good. So that we don't be here to breakfast, let the, I'm going to let this be the last question, unless Tar got a real pressing one since someone called in with this one. It says, pretty much, if you're afraid to pull over in a secluded place, what should we do? Uh, what should you do? I mean, I guess you feel like and I'm... That's fine. I mean, we've gotten that question before. Okay. The first thing you want to do is you don't want to appear that you're fleeing. So you want to maybe slow down a little bit. Don't take any erratic movements. Don't speed up. Just slow down a little bit, and you want to call the police department. If you don't know the number, call 911. If you know the local police department number, call the local police department if you have a cell phone. And tell them what's going on. Tell them that, hey, I want to pull over, but I'm going to wait till I get to the next lit intersection. I'm going to wait till I get to the next parking lot. In Fort Walton Beach, we don't have a lot of secluded areas. We have a few secluded areas. Generally, if you go a very short distance, like to the next parking lot, the next intersection, the officers are not going to really do anything about it. But you can't have any appearance that you're either trying to flee, you don't want to have a lot, bunch of movement in the car, you don't want to be reaching under the seat, you don't want to throw stuff out your window. 
Because that's all, no, but you laugh, but that's all going to raise suspicion that it's something else and it's not that you're in a secluded area. The best thing to do is to pull over and stop, especially in an urban environment. If you want to go half a block and pull into Uptown Station because they stop you just before Uptown Station, if you go half a block, nothing's going to happen. If you go miles, it, it could be an issue. If you start taking evasive action, it could be an issue. If you start throwing stuff out your window, reaching under your seat, the best advice that you can give is stop. Let the officer tell you, hey, pull up, do something else, especially if it's a marked car. If it's an unmarked car and you're secluded area, you may have questions, it's a legitimate officer, call, him to, call 911, tell them, hey, I'm being stopped. I think I'm being stopped. Here's where I'm at. Hey, can you dispatch an officer out here? So at least you know the real officers are now going to be en route to wherever you're at. Or the 911 dispatcher can tell you, no, hey, yeah, we have an officer that's trying to pull you over. But generally, you want to stop. You want to go short distance. You want to make any invasive movements. And even if you're in an area that's not secluded, and even if you're in a safe area to pull over, the first thing you want to do when you're getting stopped is really do no movements. Just hold on to the steering wheel. Don't unbuckle your seatbelt, because the biggest argument we get in people all the time is, oh, I had my seatbelt on. I just took it off when you stopped me. Leave your seatbelt on. Just hold your hands on the wheel. That way there's no confusion that, hey, was, were they going for something? Were they putting something down? Stop, leave your hands on the wheel, roll down your window, and speak with the officer. The officer then will tell you what they want you to do next. They may tell you to get out of the car. They may tell you to stay in the car. They may ask you, where is your license? Where is your registration? They may, you may say, it's in the glove box. It's in my pocket. It's in the center console. Wait for the officer to give you some type of direction or command. That is the best thing you can do. Some people are trying to be helpful. Like I said, they'll take off their seatbelt, they'll be digging in their glove box, and it just leads to possible misunderstandings. So the best thing you can do is just stay on the hand, the steering wheel, roll down your window, speak with the officer, and wait for the direction. I have one from Zoom. I have one from Zoom, sir. That's fine. I said I have until breakfast. <laughs> Hi, Chief. Thank you for... Uh taking time out to address this and serving this way. I uh, wanted to revisit uh, the diversity issue. Um, one, I uh, want to offer that uh, to, to seek diversity does not mean we have to compromise quality in terms of candidates. Uh, and then two, uh, what are we doing with regard to sort of cross-cultural competency training? Uh, are we talking about diversity as a inter and intra uh, policing process. Uh, so how your officers deal with diversity with one another, uh, but also how they deal with diversity uh, with those that they protect and serve. And those are both good questions. And I agree with you 100%. And I brought up the point that we don't compromise our standards and still have diversity within the department. So I'm glad you picked up on that. And then for the other question you asked, we do diversity in different ways. We do formalized diversity training at least once a year. In addition, we do the implicit bias training, we do other add-on trainings, but we also strongly believe in direct contact. I think direct contact is probably one of the best things we can do, is where we send officers to either different neighborhoods, to be involved with different groups, like I talked about coming here and speaking in front of the church group or at the African-American church leader or uh, community leaders uh, meetings when they have them, is to get, out, to get officers out of the group that they're accustomed with and have that direct contact. When we go to the Boys and Girls Club, when we go to other places, I think direct contact and having conversations with people is just as important as formalized diversity training. And we try to be as inclusive as we can. And we try to accomplish the training in diversity from different avenues and different angles. And we hope to do as much exposure to different groups as we can. And we like to get officers, like I said, out of their comfort zone sometimes. We want to send an officer maybe to a Hispanic event that's not Hispanic. We want to send a white officer to a black event or a black officer to a white event. And we really don't have, and I hate using terms like that, we're really categorize events and stuff like that. 
because we, we want to try to expose people to things that are different than what they're used to being around and used to being in. And we really try to accomplish that. And it's hard to give a small sound bite. It's a very complex issue. And your question was very complex. And I don't know if a short response really does justice to it. And I can tell you that if there is solutions, if there's training, if there's something that you want to put forth to us, we'll review it. We will see if we can implement it. We're always looking for ways to expound on our training, our diversity, and our community engagement and our responsiveness to the community. Okay, thanks, Chief. We got one more. Joe, Joe, I can hear Joe's stomach growling up there. So we're gonna make sure this is the last one, Joe. Of this being asked. Um, how does the power of the police unions impact how a credibility within departments is handled? Fort Walton Beach doesn't have a police union. Okay. So that question would not directly apply to us here. It's not a collectively bargained agency. Where I came from, we were a collectively bargained agency, and there was a union contract that governed different actions and how things had to be done and notice requirements and procedures and policies. And I can tell you that if somebody did something that was wrong or bad, the department down there still took action against them. Now, things may get turned over in arbitration or through litigation or through other means, but departments will still take action. In some aspects, can a union restrict some things? Possibly. Does a union help in some actions and maybe safeguard the officers in some places? Probably. But it's a balancing effect, and I think, just like I talked about everything else, I think everything boils down to community engagement and community direction and community responsiveness. I think if the community swells up and comes forward and sets down the standards that they expect from their police department, no matter how strong the union is, no matter how strong anything else is, that there is the opportunity for change and things can change. In larger, more urban environments, the police unions have much more power. In less urban environments and in smaller departments, they generally don't have as much power. All right then, well, thank you. Thank you for, thanks to all those who are online tonight asking questions, the question that came in. I wanna thank the chief and the officers that came out tonight to be a part of our uh, discussion. And again, if need be, uh, we can come back again and, and, and do this again. Uh, uh, if necessary. So again, I just want to thank him again. We didn't invite the chief. The chief invited himself to come out, and I just want to, uh, I'm so glad that he did that because this is the first time in our 27 years that a police chief has kind of invited himself to come in and talk to us as a community. Norm, we have to invite them to question, uh, you know, hiring practices and things of that nature. So to, to get an opportunity to have him come at his request uh, is really a great move forward, and I, and I want to thank him for that and thank all the officers that came with him. Uh, tonight, amen. Okay. And a great briefing, great presentation. Still with the young guy, man, you can remember all that stuff and answer. I mean, I felt bad sending you all those questions and you got them all answered and read, man. You, you're a sharp guy. We're going to keep you for a minute. <laughs> Let you stay here for Walton Beach for a while. Sounds like good. this. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Okay, a couple of announcements before we give our dismissal. Uh, meal program tomorrow. So do we still give our bag lunches for that, 11 o'clock? Uh, Sunday service, uh, those of you who want to come and join us on Sunday at 10 o'clock, so if you want to be a part of that, please feel free to do so. No reservation, okay, no reservation required for attendance. So you'll get instructions once you get here where to sit and how to go about being seated. So just please come. Youth Recognition Sunday is going to be coming up in July, so please get those report cards in so that we can recognize your children for their uh, last some six weeks or nine weeks in school because we want to make sure that we do that. So please get that information in by that date. Is that it? Okay, with that said, let us all please stand, if you will, and we give a prayer benediction and, and we'll depart. 
Eternal God, our Father, we thank you again for another great day that you prepared. And God, we just say we're glad to be able to rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for this time that we have sanctified tonight for this occasion. We thank you for blessing it, God. And now we just ask that as we depart this place, God, that you protect us, take us to our destination safely. Bring us back at the appointed time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you again. Amen.